One of the things that was evident after uh, February 22nd was that normal planning processes uh, were not equipped to respond to the earthquakes that we'd had. We um, knew that there had been uh, a process in place for quite some time, uh, going back to about 2003, where local authorities throughout, New Zealand, uh, throughout Canterbury had collaborated to put together uh, what was known as the uh, Urban Development Strategy. And it seemed to me that the fastest way that we could open up new land for subdivision, good land that had uh, the proper technical uh, uh, levels attached to it, would be to use Section 27 powers under the CERA Act. However, what that meant is that there were some people who were unhappy that their particular piece of land wasn't put into the fast track process. And so they uh, went to judicial review. Uh, and that meant that uh, we were slowed up. Uh, and the courts considered it and said, well, uh, actually you could do this a different way uh, and you could use, produce what's called a land use recovery plan or a recovery plan under the Act. Now I, uh, I've got to say, found that a little hard to understand. It's been very tough on Christchurch. It's been great for uh, Waimakariri, I might say, David, and uh, also for Selwyn. Now we've seen those population stats. Those two areas were able to move a lot more quickly than Christchurch because of this. So as a city, we're probably a bit behind the eight ball, but uh, we had to uh, comply with the court. And so um, when it says here, I directed, that's a constitutional light. It means the Crown directed um, the, uh, uh, essentially ECAN to work with uh, local authorities to produce a land use recovery plan. I want to acknowledge the huge amount of work that's gone into this from uh, retired judge Peter Skelton, who's here tonight. Uh, and. Uh, uh, the work also of uh, former councillor Sue Wells, they did a lot of work to try and pull this thing together along with uh, all of the other councils around about. So what that uh, essentially will do is help address some of the housing supply issues but one of the biggest challenges is the potential for runaway price on land. So uh, you know it's great that a lot of developers and I, I want to salute and acknowledge Naitahu at the moment uh, a lot of the land that they thought they would develop over the next 30 years is going to come on stream in the next two or three years. Uh, and you can uh, you know, see how that might affect their long-term future, but they've committed to that for the well-being of the city. Uh, but what we do need to have is a plan that, uh, that guides that. So we've received um, around about 149 large submissions, uh, and we are in the process at the moment of uh, uh, getting to a point where uh, the... Uh, comment can be put into context and that plan can be uh, gazetted, hopefully, uh, I would like to see it by the end of this month, uh, perhaps um, uh, early next year. So we just, uh, oh, hang on, what are we doing here? Sorry, okay. So this, uh, sorry, I'm not good on this stuff. This uh, map essentially shows you, uh, although I'm not meant to do this ahead of time, uh, where the uh, new areas for urban development are likely to go. This is Greenfield's um, land, um, but it, there will also be some provision in that land use recovery plan for a greater use of land inside the city. Um, and uh, while we've got a bit of discussion still to go with the Crush City Council, we expect there will be around about 9,000 empty sections in the city, uh, either you know, those that are there now plus the ones that are come, to come. And, uh, if we were able to intensify the activity on those sections, have two dwellings per section perhaps, you, you can very quickly get to a point where uh, some of the loss that we've had uh, in the city, as opposed to the whole district, uh, can be brought back into place. It's a very important thing for protecting the rating base, uh, but at the same time not allowing land price to escalate uh, dramatically beyond the capacity of people to, to afford it. So I'm happy to take any questions that you might have on that. Just raise your hand if you've got a question and we'll get to you. Not as popular as the insurance <laughs> one. <laughs> no, somewhat understandably. Uh, okay. Um, uh, Madam Mayor, oh, Your Worship, um, I uh, wonder if you do want to make a comment about social housing because I know you've got uh, interesting ideas um, there's probably nothing you can announce, but I think it's worth noting that uh, we are acutely aware that there are a lot of vulnerable people in the city and that you know, um, social housing is a, an important aspect 
of, uh, of what we're doing. Uh, Housing New Zealand expects to rebuild uh, 700 houses in the next uh, two years. Uh, that's a huge number, more than one a day. Uh, they're into that program at the present time. Uh, and uh, those houses will be at a very high spec. Uh, you'll also, also have seen the uh, Breathe project that was on TV a little while ago, looking at how we encourage more uh, inner city living. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll see some other projects coming through in that regard in the next short while as well. But you're quite happy with that? Do you want to say anything? Well, look, I'll tell you what, this will be the first time in my life I've said, Leanne, <laughs> would you like the mic? And she said, would you really like me to say something? <laughs> yes. Right. Well, um, I, I haven't got um, any sort of briefing notes with me on it, and I, I do apologise for that. I've, I've got some updates on, on where we're up to as a council. But I kind of think that we've... Um, We've dropped the ball on this quite quite considerably, and uh, so uh, and so I'm giving you a little preview of something we're going to be deciding at council on Thursday. Is that um, we've worked very quickly. I mean, we actually only got sworn in just over a, a week ago, so we're we're not doing too badly. On um, Thursday at our our second um, council meeting, we will establish our standing committees. And because we believe housing is actually one of the most core critical issues facing our city, we're establishing a standalone standing committee to deal with housing. And uh, I think that that's going to really push some emphasis throughout the council uh, because they will know that we've got this as a high priority. Now, the first thing, and I said this in my presentation earlier on, is that we as a council have to get our own house in order. Um, and if we are going to be a partner with central government and with other community agencies, then we have to make sure that we're up to the game. And uh, so we're really committed to that as a, as a council. So uh, in terms of our own social housing units, uh, we, have, um, we, we originally had 2,649 units. Uh, and 83%, I guess if you're looking at from a positive perspective, are, are still open. Uh, but 445 have closed, 113 of those in the red zone. So they are not um, coming back in their current um, position. And 332 uh, have been designated for repair. Unfortunately, the repair work is not, um, is not very good. And I think that part of the, well, in fact, it's very bad, it's 78, so let's be honest about it. Um, and I think that part of the problem is, is that uh, we were given a considerable injection, um, I think courtesy of the Minister, um, instructing EQC to give us a, um, a forward payment so that we could get on with the job. The trouble is, is I think that we're caught up in the individual assessment process um, in order to clarify whether they are economic to repair. So um, I think that a, a, a good conversation between EQC and a, I've actually quietly been talking to Sir Martin in the background, suggesting that perhaps we get together and sort this out um, much more quickly than it has done um, before. Um, but what we are looking at more expansively is to, is to, once we've got our house in order, and that won't take very long, is to, is to think about what we can do by way of partnership. So there's a development out in Hornby, for example, uh, which has been um, slowed up, and I did have a, a meeting with the Minister of Housing the other day, and he did highlight to me that there was um, a certain uh, delay in, in that particular um, uh, development going ahead. It's a wonderful uh, combination because what it involves is the council uh, selling the land, uh, the um, Housing Foundation of New Zealand uh, taking up an overarching role, but then engaging with others, Abbey Fields and, and other um, housing uh, providers who've got the expertise and the knowledge to provide the particular um, types of housing uh, that, would, that would work in a very um, you know, mixed and, and, and positive environment. And the thing was, was that he said to me, he said it would be just so good if we could turn, the, turn that first sod you know, before Christmas. And um, we've just been advised today that we're going to start on the 11th of November, so there you go. 
um, we've made a little bit of progress there as well. But I think that gives an incredibly positive example of what we can do a lot more collaboratively. And the Minister of Housing's made it very clear that he would like to see us operate on a much more collaborative basis to see what we can do together. The council may have land, um, others may have expertise, and uh, by bringing all of them together in a partnership way, I think we can do a lot more than we've been able to do to date. Well, that, that's uh, Leanne getting back in the groove. She came dangerously close to a government announcement there, but that's uh, <laughs> what we're going to have to live with, I suspect. No, that wasn't a <laughs> uh, now just uh, from Housing New Zealand's perspective, Paul Commons with a bit of an overview. Good evening. Uh, social housing, Christchurch, we have 6,000 properties, Leanne. Um, similar sort of challenge. 95% uh, of them are damaged in some way. Um, you know, 6,000 houses represents uh, 6,000 homes, which represents probably 20,000 people. Probably an AMI stadium full of people that we need to look after every day. So. Uh, we've got a big challenge, as the Minister alluded to, to build new houses. We're also repairing. We're taking an opportunity. The earthquake does present some opportunities. If you're going to repair a home, you might as well make the home, um, bring it up to, up, up to code, improve it, renovate the home. So we're going through that programme as well. So um, we look forward to working with the um, City Council and have worked with them in the past very constructively because we face the same the challenges and our focus very much like the City Council is, quite rightly. Uh, very much on our tenants, and we look forward to working together. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Tommy. Thank you, Paul. Should we move on to the next topic? If there's no question. I think we'll go. We've got 10 minutes ahead of schedule on the clock at the moment, so we'll have a big open floor session at the end. Unless you've got any questions on uh, housing, land supply, do you? We'll just take a couple now. Yep, sir. Yes. Um, I'd just like to, I'm Dave Kelly, I live in the inner city, and I'd just like to go back to the map you had, which had a blue, uh, blue highlight over uh, the central city, and I couldn't read what that is, but I imagine it's about, uh, you know, increasing density and so forth there. Now, in September, Warwick Isaacs of the CCDU, with a big fanfare, said that they were going to look at uh, zoning uh, and so forth in the inner city with a, a view to increasing density there. What he didn't say was that actually the city council had already reviewed that twice since the February earthquake. They released a revised plan for the central city, including a review of uh, zoning and so forth uh, of the residential central city stuff in December. And then at the instruction of CERA, they reviewed that again through last year. My neighbourhood group and other inner city neighbourhood groups worked closely with the city council through both of those and we were quite happy with the outcome. Why is uh, CCDU doing this again and why are they not getting involvement from the residents who live there at an early stage? We're told we'll be shown, uh, you know, um, proposals once they've been developed rather than working with CCDU while they develop that. Okay, so that, that's a... That's a... Uh, a perfectly proper process for Christchurch City Council uh, to engage in. Now, one of, one of the difficulties is that if you go through uh, any sort of uh, land use change through the district plan process, it takes a very long time. So, Leanne Delzell, uh, the Mayor and I have been talking about whether or not there can be a quicker process. The land use recovery plan is a much quicker process, but there are aspects of that that might stand for a period of time, but you'd then want to review in a, a district plan review. So the, uh, we've also had a, a change in council. Uh, so I think it's been appropriate that the council uh, had become aware of the land use recovery program with so many new councillors, uh, and that they will be, uh, I think, uh, dealing with some of that, those aspects at their meeting on Thursday, and we might move forward. But the real point is that the uh, proper job for the Christchurch City Council is exactly as you said, it's their job to do that stuff and they have uh, and when it, you talk about CCDU reviewing, it's not, it's receiving that information and putting it into a land use recovery plan. I don't know if Warwick Isaac wants to make any further comment, no that's, that's how it works. So it's not, it's not like we're trying to chop over the top of them, it's an accusation that's frequently laid at Sarah's door, it doesn't work that way, uh, we just want to move things forward as quickly as possible. Alright, another question. Yes. Hi, this is a question for you, Jerry. Yeah. I'd like to know about Janet Kramer being made homeless in, uh, just in, on January the 31st in Kaiapoi, thanks to Sierra's residential red zone policy. So 
Janet Kramer um, has gone public. She's 80. I think you went in an afternoon tea with her once, actually, Jerry. But she's due to be made homeless, so she's going from being a mortgage-free 80-year-old woman to being a homeless woman, thanks to the red zone policy. So what are you going to do for Janet and other people like her who, because their old age pensioners can't get mortgages and they cannot buy houses with their red zone payouts? So what are you going to do for Janet? Well, the first point is uh, I uh, have met Janet uh, when a broadcasting school person uh, brought her to see me at a function that was held in Hagley Park. So I know very little about her actual circumstances. Uh, what I do know is that there will be people uh, who are living in houses that are uh, subject to potential... Uh, well, they, look, they're on very damaged land, and it's uh, not advisable. Her, her house is actually undamaged, and it's well, people are building down the road from it. So, Jerry, Janet Kramer is an example of someone who is losing their housing directly as a result of your residential red zone policy. So what are you going to do for Janet and the likes of Janet, who are elderly, who've been given a lousy payout in, in relation to what houses are going for in the city now? What are you going to do for the elderly? Well, where, are the think you could... where are the emergency houses for our elderly? Yeah, look, OK. Because I don't want to live in a city where elderly people get treated like this. Uh, look, right. um, as I say, I'm not familiar with this particular person's uh, individual details. Now... Well, hang, hang on a minute. Let me answer in general, because I think you've, you've uh, thrown out there what I think is quite an unreasonable accusation, that we are throwing people out of their houses. Well, I do, frankly. I mean, there are, there are uh, nearly 8,000 households in, New in Canterbury area living or that are built on land that is uh, simply not suitable for residential occupation moving forward. Now, over 7,000 of them, have actually settled with the Crown and are, or, or are in the settlement process with the Crown and moving on. Uh, well, hang on, do I get a chance to say anything? And the, the, uh, the issue will be for some people uh, that where the, the uh, total payment that's available to them is, is the 2007 valuation. I've got to say that that was a high valuation year when we struck that valuation in 2010, uh, 2011. Uh, that they're probably going to be short. Now, I can't stand here and say I've got an answer for that particular person. But I can say that, I can say that it's something that uh, we, we have a whole unit inside Sarah that does look at exactly these situations to try and see what can be done to, to help people. Jerry, can I, can I just, on the back of that, inquire, has your unit uh, that you refer to picked up any pattern as to what is happening with elderly people um, who aren't able to purchase a new house with um, the settlement from the red zone, is, are they likely to have to rent for the rest of their lives instead? Is there any general pattern emerging? Well, look, I can, I can give you uh, one instance where um, uh, an elderly person was living in an uninsured house in the east. Uh, I think she, had, uh, she was in the vicinity, of late 70s, we'll say. Uh, in her case, uh, she was able to take the offer that the government made. Um, the reality is, and this is the harsh thing, the harsh thing is that the value in that property was written off the day that the earthquake uh, destroyed the land. So trying to get people back from that has been our whole uh, approach uh, through the, the red zone offer. No, no, with all due respect, no, I'm sorry. That's not, that is simple rubbish. And if you're saying that, you need to go and have a darn good look at some of the circumstances that are people in there. I did not write off Bexley or Avonside or any of those other areas. The land is damaged. And if you can't see that, nothing I can say here tonight is going to change your mind. But that is the fact of the matter. Now, well, sorry, look, I know that Come on, guys. here with a view. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Look, you can yell at me all you like. I don't know the details of that person you're talking about. But what I... Well, well hang on a minute. This David Ayers is saying he wants to, have, to say something about this, and I'll invite him to do so. He's the Mayor of uh, uh, Rangiora and, and therefore also Kaipo. I know Janet. Um, she lives in a double unit um, just behind the Kaipo Town Centre on Red Zone land. Um, her promised payout is $212,000. 
um, and obviously that's not enough to buy another house. That's the situation she is, is in, um, and she is, as you say, 80 years old. Um, the piece of land she is on um, appears to be undamaged. Uh, we had a special meeting in Kaiapoi uh, in near the end of 2011, I think maybe the beginning of 2012. A lot of people in that zone disputed the, um, the quality of um, the, or the decision to, to red zone that land. Uh, Jan Kupek uh, came and explained that they were actually sitting on what's like an ice float. Um, that whole section of land, which uh, is over the road from the Kaiapoi countdown, if you know it, um, is like, um, it's likely to move as a body towards the Kaiapoi River. Uh, she's only a few houses away from it. Um, in the event of another earthquake. So that's the situation of the land. Uh, there were the, most of the people who disputed the red zoning accepted it after that engineering explanation, which went deeper than any other engineering explanation that I have seen in uh, anywhere else in the, in the Waimakariri district. So I'm not saying I, I'm just giving you the facts about Janet's situation. Um, it's not an easy one for her, I know. No, well, it, it doesn't, but the, nor does the fact that the land that she owns has now got no value in it. So what we do have to do, and I'll ask uh, the Sarah people to uh, have a look and see what can be done uh, to give her some further assistance to get accommodation. Okay. Right, very good. Well, look, I'm seriously worried about a lot of old people who are in that situation. All right, right. thank you and very many much. Of those people are entitled to, thank you. Many of those people are entitled to other assistances from the state that we have discovered they are simply not picking up. All right. So we will look into it. We are moving on. Yep. Uh, we will get to our final uh, focus topic, and then following that, we will have, I would imagine, a good 45 minutes for free-for-all questions on all topics.